Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. And today, our topic is functioning as a Christian in the context of being in a cultural minority. And I have gone far and wide to bring John Dixon here from down under, from Australia. And as soon as he opens his mouth, you'll recognize he's not from Texas. Uh, John is executive director for, of the Center, now that's C-E-N-T-R-E, for Public Christianity uh, out of Sydney, Australia. And uh, John and I go back. We have done many um, projects together. I have filmed for them when I go to Australia. And so this is payback time. So welcome, John. Glad you could be with us. Fantastic. We've also done some sporting stuff together. That's exactly right. Aussie rules football, which Mm -hmm. there'll be an exam uh, after the podcast on how that works. (laughs) I think you know more about Aussie rules than I do, actually. That's actually a frightening thought, isn't it? (laughs) Um, So we're here to discuss. um, the, the kind of ministry that you have. So uh, tell us a little bit about the Center for Public Christianity, what got it launched and, and why it exists, and uh, what you all do. Well, we were uh, friends decades ago with an idea maybe 15 to 20 years ago that we wanted to one day, when we grew up, have a center that somehow engaged the public square that we'd felt had been either neglected or poorly treated by church and Christian organizations. And we thought, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if um, we could start something where we could be uh, thoughtful, generous, and articulate? Mm-hmm. We didn't really think we'd pull it off. Uh, but eight years ago, uh, we were offered, quite out of the blue, a pretty sizable grant to do what we wanted. And uh, we pitched the Center for Public Christianity because we'd already had it in our heads. And uh, we got the grant, and that kicked us off for the first uh, four years, just completely bankrolled us, which meant that we didn't have to worry for four years. Mm -hmm. Uh, We worry every day now. Yeah, exactly right. (laughs) I I understand that transition. (laughs) So uh, the best way to describe us is we're a group of scholar communicators Mm -hmm. who have a mission to take thoughtful, generous Christianity into the public square. And public square for us really boils down to the media Mm -hmm. uh, and public debates. We don't see ourselves as in any way a political lobby group. Mm -hmm. There are lobby groups that are Christian lobby groups. We're trying to commend Christ and the worldview that comes out of knowing Christ to a pretty skeptical, secularizing nation. We see ourselves as international because uh, almost half of the web traffic to our website is from outside of Australia. Hmm. But, you know, we are are located in Australia and we do a lot of work in Australia. We write for the mainstream press and appear in the mainstream media pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. We have a very large library, website library, of um, audio, video, and uh, print, and we put on events and write books and produce documentaries. That sounds pretty exciting. And the website is? Publicchristianity.org. Okay. Uh, And so let me commend that to you if you have a chance to take a look at it. It's full of resources of all kinds. Really, um, some of what the center does is very much the model for what uh, some of what we're trying to do here at the Hendricks Center as well. And so we have collaborated and, and conspired together in so, to some degree, uh, talking about how to do uh, what you do. L- let, let's talk about you, – you said uh, uh, generous is the word you used. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, why that term and, and, and what do you see that as involving? Well, I guess by generous, uh, I I mean an approach to the conversation that is willing to listen, Mm -hmm. so gives space to others to share their views. So it's listening. I think that's part of generosity. Uh, That concedes what needs to be conceded Mm -hmm. in the arguments against Christianity, Mm -hmm. the complaints that society has about the church, Mm -hmm. to the degree that it's appropriate and we feel it, we want to concede it rather than rush mm-hmm. to defending Christianity. At all costs. At all costs. Yeah. And then when we actually engage in the defense or the 
commending of the faith. We want to do so in a spirit of um, civility Mm -hmm. and uh, not uh, a defensive uh, position that sometimes you get amongst uh, Christians. Mm -hmm. Even Christians who are really confident in their faith, uh, they, they come across as defensive, maybe because they're worried that unless they win this argument in this media spot, uh, they're letting the team down mm-hmm. or they're letting God down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've tried, uh, maybe it's just personality, but maybe it's theology, I don't know. But at, at CPX, and I should say we call ourselves CPX, as you well know, yes. and the X is the Greek chi for Christianity. There, there you, you go. go. <clears throat> I'm feeling justified now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, at CPX, we uh, really feel that we can – lose well Mm -hmm. and still win. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we're not very defensive when Mm -hmm. we go in the media space um, because we feel God's big enough to cope with our mistakes, Mm -hmm. and there'll be answers there even if we can't find them. So all of that we include in this notion of uh, generous public engagement. Now um, you uh, you you walk into this media space, and and there are some interesting differences between Australia and the United States. Let's talk about how significant the Christian population is in Australia, because that will stand out to Americans. So, um, evangelical Christianity, what we might call evangelical Christianity, how well repre- how well represented is that in Australia? Not very. So any anyone who ticks the Christian box mm-hmm. is uh, about 62% in Australia, and that includes Roman Catholics, includes everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but church attendance, the public statistics on regular church attendance is 15%. Mm-hmm. But regular means once a month or more. Okay. Okay. So 15% okay. are there once a month or the, more. The number's dropping. We're dropping. And that, in, that includes Roman Catholics and Orthodox. Okay. And, okay. okay. Yeah. And liberal Anglicans. Right. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> somewhere in there, uh-huh. and it's very difficult to get the right figures because we don't have the kind of evangelical research base that you have here. I see. Um, somewhere down 4%, 5%. Uh, of Australia would be evangelical Christian believers. Now, how does that compare, and I'm assuming you know this may be a bad question, uh, how much does that compare, say, to the UK, which of course is the is the mother country of all of us in one sense or another? Yeah, very, very similar. Okay. And even the belief rates are mm-hmm. very similar. Uh, so when they've done studies of belief rates in God, almost identical Mm -hmm. uh, in Britain and Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, The atheist population, almost identical. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Britain's 10%, Australia's Mm 9.8% atheist. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here in America, it's down like 2% or Mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, we're we're very British. I mean, we started as a British colony, Mm -hmm. uh, although it's truer to say uh, we started as a prison colony of Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were, you. I heard you give a message, and in which you mentioned that uh, William Wilberforce actually had to make a case for sending missionaries to Australia. They were going to found a nation mm-hmm. without any Christian representative, mm-hmm. and uh, so they were going to send seven hundred and something convicts, mm-hmm. uh, two hundred and fifty marines, and a few other sort of settlers in the very first fleet. Mm-hmm. And it was an afterthought to get a chaplain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was through William Wilberforce's uh, work that we got a guy called Richard Johnson, who was an evangelical Anglican mm-hmm. and actually a fantastic guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some ways, I look back to him as a, as a gift to Australia because he, in a weird way, represents the kind of Christian – that there needs to be the kind of public Christian, because he was incredibly generous Mm -hmm. uh, in his approach to things. He worked really hard with convicts. Mm -hmm. The government was very suspicious of him because he didn't act as a moral policeman, which is what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They wanted someone who'd just tell all the convicts to obey Mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't. He was an evangelical. Mm -hmm. So it was grace, and it was, you know, obedience flows from grace, and he would go and hold the hand of those who were about to be executed and all this sort of stuff. So he he got into trouble a lot with the government. Mm -hmm. And, and and so I don't, I don't mean that so Christians should take that advice and get in trouble with their government. Right, right. What I mean is uh, he, he wasn't part of the power establishment. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was in one sense. His job was paid by them. But he actually sided with 
uh, those in great need. He was working power. to build bridges for the mission that he had come to perform. Yes. And during some plagues that we had in the very early years of the colony, mm-hmm. he was famous for, against everyone's advice, going and visiting the sick. Hmm. He didn't get sick himself, which mm-hmm. is uh, astonishing. And he would be the only one who'd go visit them. Hmm. We have convict letters hmm. uh, from this period back home to Britain. And one of them, very striking one, um, uh, describes Richard Johnson as the physician of soul and body. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I think that's a, a great public Christian right there. The picture has come in my mind of when the UK decides to send uh, or create a convict colony, they don't mess around. They send it thousands of miles away. You're not getting back. <laughs> yes, indeed. But I mean, you know, our feeling about that is um, they, they did us all a favor. Because uh-huh. <laughs> we live in Australia. That's right. And, uh, you know, there are far more British people wanting to move to Australia than the other way around now. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you settle. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Commonwealth politics in, an, in another venue. Um, so, so we've got this minor, minority context in which you function. The, I, I, the closest analogy I think we have to that here are parts of the Northeast and parts of the Northwest, mm. whose numbers probably aren't quite as low as what you've cited, but are close, re- certainly closer than, say, in the South here where, I mean, in Dallas, I think the statistics are that 50 percent are in a religious establishment on a given weekend. That's just – that number, I imagine, would be astonishing to an Australian. Um, and uh, and then you go from there. So, so a very different kind of context, which is part of the reason why I wanted to chat with you, because there's a lot of experience involved in thinking through what it means to represent Christ in a context in which you are really functioning as a as a cultural minority. So let's talk about that some, and and there are other peculiarities that are worth pointing out as we kind of move into the conversation. Uh, you pointed out to me as we were preparing for this that uh, the term apologetics doesn't quite work the same way in Australia as it does here. Why don't you explain that and kind of kind of what that means? What, what how do you come out of out of that? Apologetics tends to be used for bad arguments. Mm-hmm. Um, so if someone says, oh, you're just doing apologetics, that's just apologetics. They mean you're using any kind of argument, even a bad one, in order to promote Christianity. And so uh, <laughs> Christians now adopt the term uh, in that pejorative way by saying, oh, that's just atheist apologetics. So huh. we, we, they even turned it around. We totally adopted the same thing. <laughs> but I think Dawkins uh, uses apologetics. Richard mm-hmm. Dawkins uses this term in a, in a uh, very denigrating way. Uh, and it's really caught on. And so it, we, ne- we never use it. Hmm. I mean, I might, you know, especially in America where I know it's right. not a damaged term. Right. I, I, you know, the word does slip out of my mouth. Yeah. But, in, but in Australia, we will only ever talk about doing public Christianity. I mean, it's 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 not a it's not a known thing. Mm-hmm. It's not a verb to do public Christianity, right? But, right. But it's it's we think that's what it is. It's making Christianity more public. Mm-hmm. Which means you have to think about how you express and even communicate, and in some cases translate the theology that's part of Scripture in a way that the listener can connect to. Particularly because oftentimes the listener in Australia comes with absolutely no church back, background whatsoever to have any context in order to understand what's going on. Fair enough? Yeah. Um, we have quite um, high belief rates in God. We have um, a high view of Jesus. Mm-hmm. So we do have that going for us. Mm-hmm. And a general assumption that Christianity uh, had some influence on the Western world. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to give the impression that you know they might as well be pre-Christian society pagans, yeah. because I don't even think Australia is yet post-Christian. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it doesn't really work, but it's kind of pre-post-Christian. <laughs> we're definitely on the way. Right. We're not a Christian nation right. by any stretch of the imagination. But I don't think we're quite post-Christian because the major news channels mm-hmm. or the talk shows will still think to ask a Christian's view. Uh, in public. Mm-hmm. They don't think to ask the imam or the Hindu leader or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's still that memory that Christianity is uh, in some ways part of the culture mm-hmm. in a way other religions aren't. Um, 
but that doesn't mean we're given any respect in that context. Mm -hmm. So CPX will be invited onto mainstream television or radio, and that's fantastic, but then we'll be given an incredibly hard time. <laughs> yes. So it doesn't come with any privileges mm -hmm. other than the invitation to be part of the conversation. And and so I, I, I sometimes describe us as in a perfect storm mm -hmm. between Christianity's uh, credibility still because of the memory of the West mm -hmm. and contestability. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely because those two things are operating that we're getting so many opportunities at mm. CPX to mm. engage. Mm -hmm. Any more credible, any more Christian, if our nation were any more Christian, I think we'd be passe and mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't get any more controversial or contestable and people would probably think, oh, that, you, know, you don't need to worry about Christianity. But we're at this perfect blend of you invite a Christian on, mm -hmm. but then you give them a hard time. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this space where we take a lot of hits mm -hmm. and, and hopefully we lose well and sometimes we win. Yeah, the last time I was in Australia, um, I did a, uh, a gig for you guys uh, and the topic was the simple topic of hell. Mm -hmm. uh, and we engaged, uh, I was there with a, with a Catholic, with a liberal Christian, with a denominational, fairly conservative Christian. So there were two conservative voices in the group, maybe 2.5. And I have to say the host was very um, fair, uh, uh, engaged the topic positively and negatively, and and it, w it was a v a very much an evening of conversation about hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways refreshing uh, because it didn't have quite the – quite the polemical edge you might get in certain contexts. Uh, the, the host was very, very professional about what he did and the way he went about it. And so I've had, I've had a taste of this uh, conversation, and of course I've spent time in, in um, Europe as well. So between the combinations, I've, I have a sense of, of the difference really between the United States and, and Australia. Talk a little bit about, about how you approach the use of language. Um, the, apologetics isn't the only example. Uh, your book that's just come out called A Doubter's Guide to the Bible perhaps could have been titled An Unbeliever's Guide to the Bible just as easily. I mean, that's in some senses who it's aimed at, but that's obviously a conscious choice. Um, we were talking about uh, the message that you gave when you, uh, while you've been here on, uh, in which you contrasted beauty, the ugly, the resolution, and then why God. And in many ways, you're really talking about truth and the orderliness of the creation. So talk a little bit about the philosophy of communication that you guys really do work pretty hard at. I think it just arises from listening, mm -hmm. um, from using language and finding it grates with people mm -hmm. and changing the language. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't think about it much in terms of what would be the better terms to get a better hearing? I think it's more intuitive mm -hmm. growing up in a society where some words like unbeliever mm -hmm. or non-Christian mm -hmm. even, uh, greats, mm -hmm. to be classed non-Christian, classed unbeliever. Uh, a lot of people uh, really um, find uh, offensive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really just connotation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really just means you don't believe. But the connotation of unbeliever is very negative. Same with non-Christian. Mm -hmm. um, so in my church, I, I try uh, and encourage um, the s staff not to use the term non-Christian, even in their sermons, because mm -hmm. we have visitors who come. And the idea of being classed as a non-something mm -hmm. when there's something uh, on the other side of the equation is a a positive that we're all holding up right. is just inherently offensive. The connotation mm -hmm. of it is inherently offensive. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a long way around, but uh, I will often just talk of those who don't believe, mm -hmm. and that's just softer and mm -hmm. more acceptable. The doubter thing is interesting because although it is a noun that mm -hmm. is describing someone, um, it's not a non-something or an un-something, mm -hmm. and doubt in our culture is actually a positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the connotation of it is a positive thing. Hmm. And so I'm happy to pick up on the vibe that surrounds a word like that. Mm -hmm. I often use the word spectator as well, mm -hmm. which ties into our sporting culture anyway. Absolutely. Um, so a lot of people, you know, maybe they're not a skeptic or even a doubter. Mm -hmm. They're a spectator. Mm -hmm. They just want to – they just don't want to get too close. Mm -hmm. They don't want to get on the field. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to watch. And uh, so that kind of language – 
um, does really help. The most important thing I think about language is that whatever words we use, the fundamental thing is to make sure we're not speaking with any air of entitlement. Mm -hmm. And it's easy if you live in a, a Christian community and all your friends are Christians to feel like the world uh, is obliged to follow Christ. Uh, I mean, in, in a theological sense, they are, but that at a, at a societal level, mm -hmm. they ought to be listening to me because I represent the Church of Jesus Christ and the kingdom that's coming. Mm -hmm. So you better listen to me. Mm -hmm. And that ambassador motif, mm -hmm. I think, is then wrongly used for like, that means I have authority over this mm -hmm. unbelieving nation. Mm -hmm. Whenever Australians hear a Christian person speak with any air of entitlement, you've lost them. Hmm. Um, but they could hear the same ideas expressed without any sense that you have to listen to me, you have to uh, obey what I'm saying, without any of that, and they'll listen, and they'll give you a fair go. Hmm. So that aspect of language, entitlement, is uh, I think key, and 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 the difficulty here is uh, you know, I like to think about the ambassador picture as well. And the uh, to me the value of the ambassador picture is I'm a, I'm a stranger in a strange land. It's the pic and I represent someone and something um, to other people who who may or may not appreciate what it is that I represent. So I have to think about how to do that. Well, in a, and with the intention and the hope, and this is the mission part of it, of inviting them into the experience um, that believers share with God. That's almost certainly what the biblical picture of ambassador means. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Christians can take it as a kind of my authority over mm -hmm. uh, the world because ambassadors are people we bow and scrape to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you're dead right. It's a fantastic image viewed from that perspective. Mm -hmm. So the the hard thing is to deal with this. You know, our message does say you're a creature <laughs> accountable to a creator. Um, you have responsibilities before God, whether you recognize it or not. But then the flip side of it is, how do you get the person to take that frame of view or that worldview seriously? Uh, and uh, I like I like to say when when I talk about this theme with people, what would you prefer if someone were to to put something in front of you? The response that says, "Well, you're blind and in the darkness and just can't get it," uh, or the response that says, "You know, that's a good question. And now let's talk about the answer." And. Uh, um, and there is this tension that we do have out of Scripture that talks about where people are theologically on the one hand, and yet there's the relational part of how to get there on the other. And sometimes I think our theology washes out the relational dimensions of how we think about mission. Or we interpret that authority that we do have in Christ in institutional, structural terms. Mm -hmm. and. The main point I'd make on this question is that Australians anyway, I can't speak for Americans, um, hear any tone of authority as institutional and structural authority. Hmm. They hear it as you think your institution ought to be running the show. Mm -hmm. That's how they hear it. Mm -hmm. You and I might simply mean, you know, we've heard the message of God and that is an inherently authoritative message. So when we speak the words of God, everyone is under it. Sure, but that's not how it's heard. It's mm -hmm. heard as my organization's better than your organization. They see it as almost a power grab in some sense. They associate it with political and legislative and social power instead of persuasional power mm -hmm. uh, and relational power. So <laughs> it's it's complicated because you can pluck out of scriptures uh, out of the scriptures all sorts of references to authority, mm -hmm. but it would be wrong to interpret that as authority in any structural way, and it would be wrong for us to use language that helps those who don't believe think that we think we have 
structural authority. You know, it's interesting because when you think about the example of Jesus and how he went about doing his ministry, there's no doubt that he challenged people to think about how they're related to God and did so in ways that were that could be considered I would love this British word off putting, you know. Um, and yet at the same time the nature of his ministry and relational engagement was with people was such that it seems to neg to have negated an aspect of the edge of that challenge and it was that having the two things together side by side functioning together that allowed people to say yeah he may be challenging me but there's no doubt he cares about me while he's oh, issuing yeah. the challenge and this is this is key isn't it yeah. that, um, the genius of Jesus to be able to flex two muscles at the same time, mm -hmm. the muscle of conviction mm -hmm. and the muscle of compassion. Mm -hmm. And so he can thunder in public about the coming judgment mm -hmm. and then sit down at a dinner table with those under judgment. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary thing. Yeah. And, and what's more, they flock to him. Mm -hmm. um, they surround him. They want to hear him. They want mm -hmm. to be near him. Mm -hmm. um, through the history of the church, of course, uh, there have been – Moments where the church has been able to flex the muscle of conviction, mm -hmm. moral conviction, theological conviction, political conviction, really well, mm -hmm. but the muscle of uh, compassion has atrophied, mm -hmm. and we, we all know that type. Mm -hmm. Equally, uh, there have been periods of church history, particularly nowadays, mm -hmm. when the church is good at flexing the muscle of compassion and has given up conviction, mm -hmm. while well, neither represents Jesus, who was able to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there's a really important kind of uh, uh, backdrop to this kind of uh, uh, process. So l let me shift gears a little bit. You, you're in the public square on a regular basis. You're engaging um, all kinds of, uh, of people in all kinds of situations. What are some of the more challenging questions you consistently get in Australia that represent uh, the key challenges to the faith? I think you address some of these in in, in a doubter's guide, uh, but uh, and. And I just saw a clip of you on Fox News in which I think some of these key questions came up. So let's talk about those a little bit. What, what are some of the key objections that you, that you come up against? And, and I'll preface this by saying there are kinds of two classes of questions, what I might call the macro questions about God being out there in one way or another, and then the more detailed kinds of biblical questions that come up. They, they seem to be in two classes uh, if you want to think of them that way. So what do you encounter when you – when you, uh, when you, when you walk into the public square, well, you're right that there are those two kinds of questions. Um, we find a lot of the questions nowadays could could be classified as questions about the misuse of power, hmm. and so uh, forms of it are: hasn't the Bible just been used as a tool of oppression? Um, hasn't Christianity just raped and pillaged through the Middle Ages? And there's the Crusades, after all. Mm -hmm. Uh, doesn't religion cause all the wars? Uh, or what about the Old Testament violence? This, this has become uh, one of the most regularly asked questions hmm. in, in our public work. Doesn't the Old Testament uh, have uh, such a violent picture of God that is inappropriate in our day where we value human rights and, and so on? So all of these questions come from the perception that Christianity and the Bible is about the misuse of power. Hmm. It's a really interesting and, – and so that, that makes it all the more necessary for Christians never to speak as if they think they've got structural power because mm -hmm. that's the main gripe, mm -hmm. one of the main gripes. Hmm. Um, other than the normal, um, why does God allow suffering? Mm -hmm. um, is there any historical evidence? Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of – the technical apologetic – Questions. Right, right. Or I used the word apologetic. Before, yeah, it was. Uh, that you would get in a course in apologetics. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still asked. Mm -hmm. But there is this huge cloud about the misuse of power. Hmm. And how do you address that question in your, in your interactions? What do you try and do in, to, uh, to uh, neutralize that claim? Well, we, we would all, all, almost always concede that it's partly true. Mm hmm. So you take uh, the misuse of the Bible mm -hmm. uh, to uh, abuse people, to uh, condone slavery, to inspire wars and so on. There are plenty of examples of that in Christian history. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would spend uh, – it depends on how long one has – but I would spend some time talking in such a way that the person, the interlocutor, 
knows that I really feel this question. Mm-hmm. And this is not just strategy on my part. Mm-hmm. I really feel the question. Mm-hmm. And studying Christian history as I do, I probably know more of the bad stuff than the interlocutor does. So, uh-huh. you know, so I feel the question. Um, then, of course, one needs to move to start to uh, defend. Uh, after you concede, you must, you must defend. Um, otherwise, you're just saying, yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Christianity is bad, isn't it? And I, I would like to make a distinction. I often do. In fact, I did in that Fox thing you just mm-hmm. mentioned. Um, between how the Bible is used for the evil ends that are common to all culture, slavery, war, oppression. These, mm-hmm. You find them in Greece and Rome and Babylon they're, and They're Egypt. Roman. I mean, they're human. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're yeah. Roman and they're human. Yeah. Um, you don't need the Bible to pull them off. That's right. So it's not surprising that the Bible would be used as justification. Mm-hmm. The, really, the more interesting question by far is what are the things – the Bible seems to have itself inspired or drawn out of hu- humans in a unique way, in a way that you don't find in Babylon, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Mm-hmm. And, and if you put that back to the interlocutor, um, they have to admit Bible didn't give us wars because there were wars without Long the Bible. before the yeah, Bible, and, yeah. And nothing to do with the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um it's a great way to sort of steer them around to this tradition of charity toward the poor mm-hmm. uh, because it's very widely recognized that Greece and Rome didn't have anything like the charitable notions. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, pity toward the poor for Aristotle was actually a, a deficiency in a mm. human being, mm. that you would be moved by the plight of the poor is actually to show that you you are not a measured human being. So there were all sorts of philosophical reasons to be against pity toward the poor. But, of course, uh, Judaism first, Mm -hmm. Christianity inheriting it, was incredibly sympathetic and felt pity toward the poor because God did. Mm -hmm. And I want to steer people around to to, to see that these things can't have come from Greece and Rome. You love them. Mm -hmm. You love that tradition in Mm -hmm. our society. That came from the Bible. And when one thinks of it like that, yes, the Bible's used badly, but it has actually inspired beautiful things. I think it opens up a space to talk about the human heart is the common factor Mm -hmm. in the bad. Mm -hmm. But what the Bible actually inspires is not power or the misuse of power, but sympathy, humility, generosity, uh, and so on. Now, I think that, you know a great. There's a great benefit in walking down this path. So service and sacrifice, compassion, mercy. Those are the values that you see that stand out in context. I should point out that you your your training is as a classicist. Um, you uh, serve as an adjunct on faculty at Macquarie University and teach at the University of Sydney in classics. So when you're mentioning Aristotle, etc., you're speaking out of your your the background of your training in, in understanding the Greco the world. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Join us next week for part two. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.